we're joined here as part of our JSA special section on democracy in the European Union. I'm joined by John Worth, who's a blogger on EU affairs. Um, he also teaches EU politics and negotiation at the College of Europe. Um, and we've asked John to talk to us today about what democracy means in the context of the European Union, and also, I guess, from a more practitioner side, um, about the role of social media in democracy. So perhaps you could start off with this really big question of democracy um, and what it means in European politics, um, especially the EU. You read a lot, I guess, in the popular press about how the European Union can be claimed to be undemocratic. In academic circles, we have this debate about the democratic deficit of the European Union. So I guess the first question there would be, do you, do you see those um, accusations as fair? Is it right to say the EU has democratic failings or not? I think it is right to say that it has some democratic failings, um, although the extent to which those democratic failings are more severe or less severe than you see at a national level is now, I think, open to some debate, um, particularly after the 2019 European elections. Across a bunch of different European Union member states, most notably Germany where I live, um, there was a considerable turnout increase, meaning that actually European elections have now got an equivalent turnout to the, at the same sort of level as land, so state elections in Germany. Um, and considerably higher than you get at local elections. So there's somewhere in between, okay, probably still second order elections, but, but some kind of democratic improvement. When you also compare it also to then to the country of my birth, the UK, um, and you look at some of the democratic deficiencies which have become clear during the, 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 the Brexit situation, the fact that Boris Johnson has, at the time of speaking, um, a majority of minus 45 in the British uh, the House of Commons, but has not been subjected to any vote in the House of Commons. Um, it would be unforeseeable that you'd have Ursula von der Leyen as a Commission President who did not have uh, the support of at least a majority, a working majority in the European Parliament for her nomination. There's something that has always intrigued me, which is a slightly different question, which is this basic thing of uh, do elections force political change? So in a certain way, we have elections, we have the rule of law, we have majorities which, 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 that work or may not work. But I still think there's this essential problem that if I vote left, am I going to get a European Union that goes left? If I vote right, am I going to get a European Union that goes right? Um, am I going to be able to judge, ah, oh, hang on a minute, I'm not really very happy with the way Jean-Claude Juncker has been uh, Commission President over the last five years, I'm going to vote left this time, so therefore I'm going to get a lefty European Commission President now. That type of basic understanding of kind of how my vote will affect what happens at the European Union level, that has largely been lacking due to a lack of full Europe-wide political debate, and, and of course, bearing in mind the complexities of European Union politics, the need of at least two and often three political parties in the European Union in order to manage to get an agreement in order to make anything done, essentially. And so that's why I found the, I found the European election campaign that I, I looked at most closely in Germany to be rather stodgy, kind of like, we're all pro-Europeans. Well, yeah, like, what sort of Europe do you want here? Well, we're all pro-EU because, well, the alternative of the Deutschland, they're the Eurosceptics, they're the Antis. And so that, that often means that you, you don't have an election which is kind of full of proper political controversy because it's kind of pro-Europeans versus the kind of populist Eurosceptics, which, which is partly why those, those elections feel not very vibrant, if you like, in comparison to a general election. Yeah. So there are democratic deficiencies, but they're kind of different than some of the democratic deficiencies we have at a, at a national level. There's obviously this thing that kind of nags at me, and I, I, if I were to be able to give you an answer, I'd kind of, we wouldn't be talking about these things, I suppose, which is the... The extent to which, uh, what, what about the kind of I, I, the Colin Crouch kind of direction of sort of post democracy, i.e., what happens when political parties are hollowed out shells? Uh, is our representative democracy overall healthy or not? And then there's obviously the question of whether the, uh, what the European Union does, does that kind of give a framework for democratic accountability, or is it itself uh, being it above and beyond member states, is what's actually limiting? member states room for manoeuvre at the national level. And it's a bit of both of those, ultimately. So this idea that the European Union is just necessarily has a, a democratic problem, I, I don't really agree with that altogether, but there are certain democratic deficiencies in areas for, for, for greater improvement, uh, which I think that we could see. And then the picture from 2019 is a mixed one. Turned out it's up more interest in European elections, perhaps, than, 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 than ever before. But then we had afterwards the, the nomination of Ursula von der Leyen coming out of nowhere, the Spitzenkandidat process being put in question, and the extent to which actually was there a proper Europe by debate before the European elections, not so much. So it's, it's a mixed um, uh, a mixed scorecard, yeah. if you like. 
You, you made a couple of comparisons there. So you talked about the EU versus what was going on in Germany mm. and the Lend yeah. um, elections. And you also sort of mentioned the UK as well. Do you think there's a trend that when we look at democracy in the EU or we try to assess how democratic it is, we, pra- we perhaps apply criteria we'd use in nation states and national political systems? Yes, but how else are we going to do it? Yeah. Um, um, well... I suppose you could compare it to other international organisations, but then no, no, no other one has got any more, any more election. Uh, so, so not in, in, in NATO or the UN or whatever. Um, I'm also kind of, as someone who spent some years before campaigning for federalism, and also seeing the deficiencies in German federalism, you must say as well, is when those levels are just too mixed up and you don't have clarity of decision-making at one level, the population doesn't fully understand it. And so this idea, I've never been in favour of kind of democratisation of the European Union via involvement of national parliaments, for example, because I think that's barking up the wrong tree. You don't democratise Germany by giving the Bundesländer more power through the Bundesrat. You do it by giving members of the Bundestag, the, the elected ones, more power to control the executive, for example. So I think, I think the efforts to democratise the European Union should be through the European level per se, not through trying to find better ways that member states can influence what the European Union does. So, but, but again, comparatively speaking, I don't think you've got any other re- relevant comparison other than to compare it to a national level. Okay. One of the things you mentioned about the European Parliament elections this time around, the sense that, you know, did we have a European-wide debate? You're very active on social media, you run a sort of well-known blogging platform. What what role can you see social media as having in fostering perhaps that European-wide debate? Do you think it has a role to play, or it has to a certain extent? And the uh, that's kind of sort of a question that over master students have kind of posed me over the years when they're sort of like, is the Habermasian public sphere uh, to be found in blogging and in social media? And my my normal answer is, well, not really. Um, first of all, because the number of people participating in that debate and discussion is simply relatively low yeah um and indeed the real political controversies that we've seen everything from the kind of greek debt crisis through seeing what's happening with salvini and the collapse of populism in italy through to brexit even that's kind of other europeans looking at essentially a national european problem um so if you look at the total number of twitter followers or facebook likes for individual parliamentarians uh, before a european election it's rather low. Now, the European Parliament down the road from where we're filming here, they're very proud of that they're, they're the most liked Parliament uh, on uh, in the world, I think, on, on Facebook. But that's more because they think that they've got a legitimacy problem and they put a lot of effort into yeah. saying, oh, look, people like us. So there are a bunch of, kind of Europeans and Erasmus students and so on who like the European Parliament. And I think that's really answering the democratic deficit problem really very much. Like, the German Bundestag, as an institution, doesn't even have a Facebook page because it doesn't even feel it's got a legitimacy problem that individual Bundestag members have, yeah. right? So, uh, part, part of me is a bit annoyed by the European Union that wants to sort of communicate, we are the European Union and we're good and you ought to like us. Whereas actually, to have a real democratic debate, it's like, these are the controversies that there should be around what's going on in Brussels. And you should be able to criticise what Brussels yeah. is doing uh, but at the same time still wanting it to exist. So, um, so for example, uh, this morning before we started this filming, is, um, Ursula von der Leyen, the Commission President, only has, has, has announced um, her team. Um, and, um, and some of those nominees are of, of questionable quality or questionable political background, and some of the way the portfolio has been allocated is rather, rather unusual. And so therefore I feel it's perfectly fine that we should be able to be criticising that. Um, there's also this, this reported commissioner for, for protection of the European way of life, which seems a rather ridiculous thing to have a commissioner for. Now, it should be fine for me to be able to, to, to complain about that, but it's only going to be a matter of time online before someone goes, well, that shows why the European Union is really bad that they shouldn't have a commissioner that's called that, right? So I think it's really important that we should argue about the European Union and criticise it, but assume that it will carry on existing. I not fall into this pro-European versus Eurosceptic way of looking at the European Union all the time. That's why I'm also mildly frustrated by people who should be allies of mine, people like Eva Hoshna, for example, because oh, all the pro-Europeans should unite. Well, no, I'm not sure they should unite, right? I think it's fine that the Greens didn't vote for Ursula von der Leyen as commission yeah. president. They said, we disagree with her policy line. Of course, we'll work with her in the future, but we shouldn't have to support that. And that's fine. I mean, the, the polity itself should have its own dynamic. Um, but to try to get that out from Brussels and into the member states and down to the level of, everyday, of the everyday population, it's really hard because ultimately much of what Brussels does 
is probably not really of an everyday concern to most yeah. most citizens, uh, which is probably not necessarily a bad thing, I suppose. So one of the things you mentioned in that is how the European Parliament and other EU institutions have, you know, they've, they've all got these very well-managed online platforms and social media yeah. accounts. Um, but, but thinking about the challenge social media presents, mm. I mean, is it a challenge to democracy in Europe? Is it, should we think of it more as a threat? Because we, you know, you see various stories about how social media may or may not be manipulating discourse and debate, or is it an opportunity to try and, you know, bridge that gap between citizens and... Um... Things I think is, uh, I see it personally as an immense opportunity, right? Without it, I wouldn't be sat here having this yeah. conversation with you. And indeed, I followed you or you followed me on, on Twitter first. That's how the, com the commun communication started. For me, as somebody who's kind of a generalist, like part, part practitioner, part thinker, part writer, part a community graphic design and coding as well, like for someone who's got that multitude of skills, social media has given me immense opportunities. In this town, I'm well known as a blogger simply because I had ideas and I would write them down and blogging yeah. gave me a platform to manage to, to, to ex express those views. It also gives me a way into the mainstream media as well, so appearing on, on radio and TV to talk about European Union politics. So at a personal level, that's been an, like an incredible liberation. Um, the difficulty is, is that how do you make a living out of that? That's something which I've never cracked, right? I earn no single cent from my blog. It's kind of a lost leader for other work that I do. And that then puts under pressure the mainstream media as well, because if we're all expecting our content for free, that means how do you actually manage to return a profit? That also means that all of the people who work in Brussels reporting on the European Union have no money. Newspapers have no money. That means the quality of reporting on the European Union goes down. That's before you even come on to bots, fake news, filter bubbles, uh, and, and, the, and the kind of framing, framing of debate. Um, and there I've got major concerns. Um, the extent to which our attention spans are limited, um, do we really engage with people outside of our own um, our own sphere? Now, I do. I'm quite lucky. I count among my sphere of friends actually quite a number of pro Brexit people, and so and I count the press officer of the Brexit Party as a, as a, as a personal friend. Um, but we are never going to. We we kind of find there's no point engaging with each other online because it just yeah. turns into a trolling fest. Like, what's the point? Um, and so that's. That I find frustrating, um, and, and somehow that way of sort of looking at politics, the sort of throwing an idea out so as to just use up every person's time, right? um, uh, I don't know if you encounter this, this so-called bullshit asymmetry principle, the, the, amount, the amount of time it takes to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude much larger than the amount of time it took a person to produce the bullshit in the first yeah. place. And I kind of feel my life in online politics is defined by that. And so Boris Johnson, for example, said, oh, the, we're not going to leave the European Union. The European Union is going to kick Britain out because it's not going to nominate a, a European commissioner. And there are a multitude of different ways around that. There's also no even mechanism of kicking the UK out. The UK itself is leaving because it, it chose to leave and trigger Article 50. So the EU is not kicking it out. So that story from Boris Johnson, which doesn't really stand up to either political logic or legal scrutiny, ends up on the front page of The Independent, causes this big splash. People are then coming to me and saying, John, is that true? Does that work? And I spent hours trying to explain to people why it's not altogether clear, but it looks yeah. like that that doesn't work. And then after that, I'm absolutely shattered. I'm not paid for helping people out to try to, 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 to respond to that. And so it kind of, if you, and, and that was not even one that came from social yeah. media. The debate then happened on social media. And so that combination of factors I find very, very hard and very, very difficult to deal with. Ultimately, what it's got to come down to, and the good ones, the genuinely good ones, and you know the good ones when you see them, are the type of politicians who their online presence is very consistent with their, how they behave offline, that they take clear standpoints, um, that they can communicate those in a, in a simple and digestible manner, they're willing to acknowledge when they're wrong because we can't be, we can't be right all the time. And some of those, at least, therefore, are ones who command reasonably large audiences um, online. For example, Margrethe Vestager, now to be nominated as Vice President of the European Commission, she's always been like that. She's very fair in the way that she communicates about the European Union, acknowledges the limits of it, talks in a normal language that, that, that people can understand. And so you take those kind of approaches, I think that that's fine. Um, most of the people, and that's a kind of another, another concern, because I've done plenty of consultancy over the years for, about the online presence of MEPs and, and, and regional politicians in Germany. So most, 
most politicians don't have the skills to, yeah. to, to cope in this environment. Um, if you've spent 10, 15 years just kind of running your local branch of your political party where not offending anyone ever is, is, is the main way of getting yourself up, the very type of candidate who ends up becoming an MEP is exactly the sort of person who is not adapted for dealing with that, um, uh, with that online environment. Um, the leader of the party I'm a member of in Germany, the German Greens, he decided to leave Facebook and Twitter because he just couldn't hack it. Um, and so I think that's really the wrong, the wrong answer. But that kind of the sort of going with the flow of social media, curating a community, finding the ways and means of building trust in that community. It's a time-consuming and complicated process. It's really doable. But many of the people who are politicians are exactly the type of people who can't really do that. Yeah, it strikes it strikes me from what you're saying. There's a there's a bit of a paradox here. So mm. on the yeah. one hand. Um, social media is a potential solution, it's a potential force for good in, you know, connecting citizens to what's going on at what might be seen as a distant institution, yeah. um, connecting different people together and sort of creating this pan-European wide debate, if you like. Yeah. But, you know, if potentially there's a downside to this as well. You yeah. know, it, it, it does require a lot of effort for you to successfully engage in it. Yeah. Really, how many people are engaging and are, are they talking with each other, right. or are you just talking to yeah. yourself? Because there's also a kind of an intellectual and personal thing to this, right? I, I commanded I I mean, an enormous network of really brilliant people online, so um, uh, statisticians, economists, lawyers, people who can answer you any complicated question at any, at any particular yeah. moment. And that's extraordinary if you're really looking for those answers. Now, if you're not looking for those answers, right, you're just looking for essentially a simple thing that reassures you in that particular moment, then, um, uh, then I've got my worries. There's also these things, well, a lot of these processes are really complicated, like how do you break down those complicated processes into a way which is both correct and is digestible yeah. on social media, and that's really tricky. So this, I think, nicely brings us on to another question mm -hmm. then, which is around political education and raising awareness of how things work. Yeah. But to what extent can social media help with that? Can social media help us understand how politics works in democracies? Is it a good educational tool for citizen engagement or...? Um... Yeah, yes, uh, and also I think it's a really good teaching tool um, uh, as well. Um, because it can, allow, it can allow you as a non-specialist person to reach the specialist in a way that you would never, you would never otherwise yeah. do. Um, I can't pick up the phone to a commissioner. I can't, well, I don't live in Brussels, so I can't go to events where commissioners are speaking. I'm not a lobbyist, I have no access. But on Twitter, if that, if that commissioner is there themselves in person, I can find out, I can ask. And if that commissioner is good, then I'll get answers. And so that gives me a kind of way in and, and yeah. an access. Um, it's also that um, if you've built that kind of reputation of trust and people then come to you, then you can have a genuine and real and good conversation. And so it kind of lowers a barrier to entry. I think that's, I think that's really good. The difficulty is, is that how do you, how do you separate um, <coughs> fact from opinion or what is truth? Or how do you, how do you define, yeah. how do you define what truth is? Um, and I, I, I find that I found that very difficult. Um, I, I also I also go out of my way individually to, there's a page on my blog that says, why you should trust this blog. It essentially says, this is what my professional background is. Yeah. These are the areas I've worked in. These are the qualifications I've got. That's why I write this stuff, right? Like, you will never find me commenting on American politics, ever. It's not that I'm not interested, but I know no more than the next person, so I'm not going there. now. Importantly, in comparison to someone who, um, who's a regular journalist reporter, uh, so I was having a conversation yesterday with John Stone, who's the Independence uh, Brussels correspondent. He has to report on things about which he knows nothing, and he knows he knows nothing. Well, that's no slight on him. Any reporter has to do that. And of course, if you report on something about which you know nothing, you're much more likely to make errors. And so that's a bit, therefore, the difficulty is, how do you know if you just see it comment or, or a tweet or a blog post or something that looks viable and looks shareable, how do you find the way and means of knowing is that trustworthy information or not? Now, if you look at the studies of that on kind of like of, of, of what determines whether someone would share something, the most trustworthy source is someone who's a friend of yours. Yeah. Right now, I might be a trustworthy friend and I hope in EU politics I am a pretty trustworthy friend, right? But 
I'll get, I don't know, one in 10 stories wrong, one in 20 stories wrong. And then I'm, I'm forever then going down the route and also with the difficulty it then gets out of hand. If something that is wrong just goes far and wide, yeah. how do you kind of haul it in? You can't even kind of haul it in or, or correct it. Like there's a tweet I wrote this morning that had a, a, an error in the date in it, right? The best was correct, but like, what do I do now? Like, do I kill off that, the content that I produce because I can't correct it? And so, so some of those things an, an annoy me quite a lot. What, for me, what it ultimately boils down to is I've, I've developed over time my own very particular media consumption, and I've got my own understanding of who I will trust. And that's constructed in a very different way than my parents would have done it, for example. So I come from a family where we grew up just with Radio 4 and, and, and BBC News on all the time. I don't trust pretty much any BBC journalist on reporting about Brexit. I don't think they're adequately factually accurate. Now, so it is not, so I will judge the individual journalists now. Well, one of the best journalists reporting on Brexit in this town in Brussels is the Sun newspaper's Brussels correspondent, Nick Gartridge. And I find myself, hang on a minute, like, John, you're a lefty, like, like, what are you doing? Like, agreeing so often with the Sun newspaper's correspondent. Now, it's just a breakdown of our own, own systems. I've been able to assess that he is a trustworthy source, admittedly with his ideological bias, so there's, yeah. there's an interesting thing uh, here, go on. <laughs> which is, which is, does this place responsibility on ourselves? We can talk about social media as being yeah. this wonderful, brilliant tool that can help connect us to politicians, yeah. a really great information gathering yeah. means. But, but really, is it is it the same it's always been insofar as we still maintain some element of responsibility yeah. for what we can do? Well, totally. And, and, and I... And I try to take, personally, and I try to take that responsibility incredibly seriously. That's also why, for example, I try to avoid anything that's algorithmically filtered. I yeah. just keep everything chronologically filtered in, in the way that I consume the news in as far as I can, trying to avoid exactly those sorts of biases. But the amount of time that it's taken to build my own kind of news monitoring there and the kind of mental capacity that it's taken, that's enormous. And that's also something that I do as well, particularly on the Brexit story, because I follow that very closely also for my work. I actually then also have a role repackaging that for non-British audiences. Uh, an American journalism prof came to me the other day on Twitter and said, like, why are no British media trying to do the explainers? Well, that's simply because perhaps they haven't got the mind space for it, or perhaps they haven't got the resources for it. But also there's that need for kind of explaining and repackaging, right? Because if you just take that deluge of information and try and process it yourself, you're overloaded incredibly quickly. And so I can't like this. Just sometimes I'm just some, sometimes caught out about other European countries, right? I've spent quite a lot of time in Italy for work purposes, and I haven't been able to follow the Italian. Like, hang on a bit. How did that happen so quick? I've just missed it because I haven't got the mental capacity for that. And so, how you deal with that kind of? Even though I'm a complete news junkie, I'm overloaded and I'm about my mental yeah. limit. Now, if you're not someone who's a news junkie who's spending that amount of time online as I am, then how you make head or tail of that is a real problem. So there's, there's another issue here as well. We, we see all these reports about the way social media can be manipulated. Mm -hmm. You talked about how algorithms basically curate what we see in yeah. a certain way. And, and you, know, you see all these reports about how um, various organisations will, will try to gain things to either gain traction, the sort of rise of clickbait and yeah. everything. What, what do you think this means for social media as a medium we understand? politics through and what do you think the response is going to to be to that do you think is there more regulation of social media and the internet on its way because of that um how do we tackle this issue of fake news while still sort of maintaining the benefits of social media to try and um, promote dialogue and discourse and open exchange of information this is really tricky because not least because the main platforms that we use are not European ones, so the extent yeah. to which we can really shape the way shape the way that they behave. Um, one thing that I I would like is or two things I would like. First is an algorithmic default. So this is a Facebook point. Is um, there's a little button next to a status on Facebook that says I want to see less of this. Right? And not all users use it, but it doesn't yeah. take so much less of this. But what does that mean? Right? What's the impact? Is I want to see less of this type of content, less from that person, less photos or videos or whatever it was that I clicked on it. And so I thought, well, at some point, no. 
I'd like to set it back to how it was. Like, set it back. Maybe that friend that was annoying me two years ago, I want to hear something from them now. Like, give me the default. Mm. There is no default. Right? You can't set it back. Like, whatever I did two years ago, and whatever, did, whatever changed that name to my Facebook experience, I can't revert it. Right? So having a give me back to the default algorithm would be a basic one. Second, you've got to do something about the business models. Um, the, I would pay to use... Twitter. Right? Now, there used to be a very interesting independent Twitter app called Tweetbot that I liked very much, but Twitter made no money out of anyone who used Tweetbot. So they restricted the data that Tweetbot could get to render that third party app unusable. Now, I understand that Twitter needs to make money, but it doesn't only have to make money out of advertising. It can make money out of people who would subscribe, and I would subscribe. If I wanted, I'm willing to buy a neutral, non algorithmically filtered Twitter. But I can't do it. There's no one who can even give money to do that. I.e., if you want, and I don't know what percentage of Twitter users, but however much they calculate they make out of me out of advertising, I'll happily give them in cold hard cash so as I can better choose to structure my data the way I want to. Right? So even the data I can get to analyze who's retweeted what, for example, a third party app could have given me that before. Now it can't. And so if I, I'm obliged to use Twitter's analytics. So those are two, at least an algorithmic default and another way to pay rather than relying on an algorithm. Because basically, if you, while we are doing political social media, right, look at the Spanish social media environment on Twitter. Right? It's heavily dominated by discussion of football. Right? So now, if I'm a fan of Real Madrid, I want to make sure I'm going to get more and more content of Real Madrid and I'm going to see in my feed other fans of Real Madrid or, or players or coaches or whatever that might be. And that might mean I'll buy more and more merchandise from Adidas or Nike or whoever it is who supplies those shirts from Real Madrid. That's fine. But I don't want that in politics. I want difference of view. I want to be able to control that, right? I might be of a political party, but I'm not so, it's not akin to being a supporter of Real Madrid rather than Barcelona. And, and I want that control. I, so we are using social media with, with that has an algorithmic structure, which is basically geared up for supporters of Real Madrid or purchasers of Red Bull, not one that's geared up for our understanding of our political debate. Because again, Twitter and Facebook make relatively little money out of the political. Yeah game on it, on, on those networks, and a lot more out of just pure commercially selling stuff. Yeah? And so therefore, how you separate those out uh, is a very important question. There's another thing that I don't know what to think about it, is, is, is algorithmic transparency, which is essentially to say, tell us what your algorithm does. Now, the problem is, if you do tell people what the algorithm does, it also means it's easier to game it. Right? Now, there's also a problem with that. Um, so I don't know. I don't know quite what what to think about that. Well, this this nicely leads on to the next question, mm. which was, you know, is transparency a potential way forward about how social media is works and how it um, is curated and how, you know the, the yeah. algorithms behind it, and and does that mean we're essentially looking at um, regulation of social media, regulation of the internet? What are the advantages of that, and what are the drawbacks of that? I mean, it's, it's, it's tricky and it's, it's also one where I, I'm, very personally, I'm very personally conflicted right? uh, the, or even where politicians should even step in to regulate that the, the biggest thing I've ever done in my career ever was nothing to do with the, the EU it was called the Atheist Bus Campaign but there's probably no God and that's not where you enjoy your life on the side of London buses we didn't have the same on the side of Berlin buses or, 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 or Rome buses because there was political control over advertising in those countries and there wasn't in the UK and that's why our campaign ran. And so I'm very grateful that we as atheists had a role in the public debate and could use freedom of speech in order to manage to, 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 to have our say. And so therefore a state, I kind of, I have my worries about only, I would only want the state to step in to limit what we can say in only the most extreme, extreme circumstances. I think then there is a responsibility on the platform owners to make sure that they they can set their rules of what they do or do not think is is yeah. acceptable. They also need to have robust systems of making sure that fake content is removed. But the difficulty then is again it still comes back to a, a business point. So you think you can make a, a tr inciting hate is not allowed on on Twitter, but Donald Trump incites hate on Twitter. Is Twitter going to close down Donald Trump's account? Never. 
because it makes money out of that because it gets so many clicks of anger and retweets and people spend time on Twitter who put their eyeballs on, 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 on advertising. So there's, there's a clear inconsistency there, but conversely, if you try and regulate that through the courts or you regulate that through, through political regulation, that, that, that worries me as well. And so I, I, find, that, I find that an, an inadequate solution. Um, I, 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 I think that algorithms to help users identify fakes are extremely useful, for example. So some United States universities have developed kind of, is that a bot uh, algorithms? Um, so a more generalized use of technology like that, I think would largely help. There's also the big problem uh, that there's a, uh, there's a gender and ethnic bias in all of yeah. this. Um, in the algorithms, we know, but also in terms of users, right? I'm a guy, I get much less on Twitter than women do. Yeah. Um, how do you, can you regulate that? Well, again, then if you, and I'm worried about the state regulating that, the platforms themselves could potentially, could potentially regulate that. Or alternatively, you look at finding some other alternative to Twitter or Facebook, you make your own self or community regulated system, or also or some, um, trust, trust-based rating system. I don't know, like the way that TripAdvisor rates hotels or something. But yet, even those can end up being gained. So, so those are those are some of the headaches I have. There, there was a tool also that was doing around of like trying to analyze what is the gender balance of your of your Twitter followers. Now, although I I have also I don't always respect it, but I generally have a rule to try to be civilized, although sometimes tough on Twitter, and to not swear. And, to try, and I hope I'm being as inclusive as I can, and I'm definitely not bullying people. The, it turns out that 70% of the people I engage with on Twitter are men, right? And 60 something percent of the people I follow are men. But how did that happen, right? Like I've, I've ended up with a bias without me even being aware yeah. that I had it. Um, and so, so there's a whole bunch of complicated matters there. So again, it comes back to uh, I think this kind of repeats itself across all of my activity in social media, is what can I do myself and start with that to try to act as an example to others, yeah. i.e. do my own best to make sure I'm aware of my biases, to make sure I reduce the impact of algorithms, to make sure I treat others the way I would like to be treated by them, yeah. try to make it clear who I'm working for, where I am, why, why I'm saying what I'm saying, to try to make sure I don't go off my topics and end up tweeting about other stuff, which would therefore I'm more likely to make errors, to apologize if I make errors, um, those kind of things, to at least try to set an example, because that's, that's at least the bit I can control. So a rather inadequate answer, but that's the least I can Well, I think it comes back to this issue we were talking about earlier about it. essentially self-regulating yeah. or you know, self-managing what you look at, um, not only in terms of what you choose to engage with, right. but also how right. you choose to engage with yeah. it. I wonder if we can talk a bit about um, the EU's use or the yeah. EU institution's use of social media. So, um, and, and how Twitter and other social media platforms can sometimes be used as a form of um, diplomacy now. So, yeah. you, you know, Donald Trump, I guess, is the perfect example, you know, essentially foreign policy by Twitter. Um, Donald Tusk, for example, is being picked up on his use of Instagram, for example. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what are your views on this? Is, is, is social media being used in this way um, a positive thing, a negative thing? What are your views? Depends on the individual politician, right? Um, it's interesting that um, in the current commission, the Juncker commission, right, 28 to 28 commissioners have a yeah. Twitter account. Uh, you won't find 28 out of 28 ministers. I think, in any national government that do. Um, and so the EU has kind of latched onto social networks as this way of basically, you know, we've got this problem that no one understands the European Union, media don't want to report on it, so let's try and kind of go straight out to the population and see if we can communicate with them directly. Now, that as, a, as an effort, I don't think is a, is, is a bad one. Uh, much of the problem, as I see at the European Union institutions have, particularly the European Parliament, the Commission as well, to a certain extent, is yes. basically, we are the European Union, this is what we're doing, this is why it's good. So it comes across as like slightly propaganda-ish. No, it's not incorrect, right? You're not yeah. like it's not saying black is white, but it, it feels a bit formulaic. It feels a bit staid. And then a lot of the politicians are sort of see that that's what's happening, 
but largely don't understand it. They have Twitter accounts, so they need their staff to run because, well, you've got to be on Twitter, so put out some nice picture of yeah. someone. I, I can't see any more pictures of Karina Kretsu in boring conferences or Violetta Bolt standing in front of EU flags. Like, that's what their Twitter, Twitter profiles are just full of. Um, that doesn't really help any of us. Um, there are some politicians who are naturals at it, and I think that's helped them build their reputation. People give them the benefit of the doubt to a greater yeah. extent. So one that did it really well, and not in the commission but ending when the previous commission was Nelly Cruz. I even heard a, a, a standing ovation for her use of Twitter among a bunch of net nerds, because they didn't even agree with what she was doing, but they agreed with the way she was doing it, um, yeah. which, is, which is quite nice. So if you deploy that in a way which makes it look like it's consistent with how you are as a person, uh, and you can break news that way, you? You, can also, you can also show kind of utility, if you like, to your audience, then that actually, I think, helps prioritise, I would say, some of the more interesting politicians in European Union politics. Like, he's an interesting and edgy character, Donald Tusk, and the way that it comes across on Twitter is exactly like that. So also can use that thing, so when there was something in the middle of the Brexit crisis, he was looking after his grandson or granddaughter, for example, sitting in the garden. Like... It's using a visual to make a very political point. Yeah. It's like we're not we're not stressed by this at this particular moment of what's going on in the Brexit negotiations. So, or there are others like there are there are, there are politicians that want to kind of brand themselves in a certain way. Now, I might not like um, the Austrian politician Sebastian Kurz on Instagram, but like I'm sure if you're a 70 year old grandmother, the, it's part of the brand, right? He's the kind of guy you'd like to have as your grandson. So it's kind of the whole sort of yeah. polished brand, and then social media is one of, is one of the components of that. The where it where it worries me is of course is then the politicians that essentially step into those kind of controversies and use it as a megaphone for for essentially not like we've always had lies, dumb lies, and statistics in in, in in politics, but essentially basically constructing a fake narrative for themselves. So some of the ones very few people have blocked me on Twitter, but some of the ones that have are people like Daniel Hannah and and and, um, uh, and the M, the former MP for Clacton, whose name currently escapes me. Uh, those cars well, right? Um, who, who, even when it's a basic fact, don't acknowledge that they're wrong, right? So I got blocked by Carswell for pointing out because he said that Victor Orban was a member of Jobbik, right? And I know that Orban's extreme, but he is a member of Fidesz. He's not the member of the fascist party. It's like, sorry, you're actually not right, right? Now he's right wing, but he's not that right wing. Yeah? Block, yeah? or or. Uh, or um, uh, Hannah lives in such a f- like fake environment that it even fakes pictures. Like, oh, I went out for a really nice walk in the in the Sussex countryside. I mean, it's a picture that he stole off the internet somewhere else, and it's actually in Wales. Yeah. Or look at these juicy steaks I've just been having. We'll get great steaks imported after Brexit from uh, from Argentina, and he's just ripped off a picture of a steak from a German restaurant's website. Like, these people have constructed such a weird arrangement. Uh, uh, environment for themselves, yeah. they don't themselves know where the difference between truth and lies is anymore. What, what do you think this means though? So if we think about the future of how we're governed, if we're saying social media is now increasingly popular on yeah. politicians, but they're also using it to construct this brand and this sort of self-managed identity, yeah. what do you think this means for how we as citizens are governed? Does, does, it, does it get in our way? Or It, it worries me because the there's also needs to be a role of journalists in this. And so, so the fact that Boris Johnson thinks that he can speak to the British population through Facebook, for example, and the commissioners have tried that as well. And the commissioners also at some point got in a controversy that invited some YouTubers along to cover the State of the European Union address. And then some more of the YouTubers cover it, covered were they not happy with. And then the commission tries to sit upon them and go, sorry, you can't say that. And the YouTubers like, well, so do you actually, we can, but then probably won't get an invite the next time around. Um, and the difficulty is I, I, I don't have a press pass, but with some bloggers try to get press passes, but, were, were, but they were not from the regular media. Yeah. And so therefore, so there's this, this sort of, you're making this kind of grey zone of kind of commentary at, and we don't know how, what, what the right way is to deal yeah. with those. And on the politician side, you're making politicians who communicate predominantly via social media. Also bear in mind that political movements like Pegida in Germany or would, would probably not exist for it not for Facebook. And then another right-wing populist party, like in Austria, the FPÖ, the Freedom Party, the right-wing populist party, they're by far the most professional political operators on Facebook there is, because mainstream media, don't, they don't think really cover them fairly. So they build a whole own media environment uh, on, on, on social networks. So I, I, have, I have grave concerns about that, because you still need experts 
sorry to sound a bit retro about it, but you still need experts who can understand that process, package that for people, explain that story, go and dig, yeah. do classic journalism. And the difficulty then is, is that you, if, if you make your own whole media environment, you, you, you can't fully understand that picture. Well, I think this nicely brings me on to sort of my last mm. question, mm. which would sort of be just, you know, from your point of view, almost like a quick fire question, mm. thinking about democracy and the role of social media, are you optimistic about that or are you pessimistic? Um, I think I'm kind of half, half optimistic and half pessimistic. There'll be brilliant things that brilliant people will do that we will be encountering in the days and weeks and months ahead. There'll be fantastic politicians who inspire thousands or even millions of people because of what they can do via social media. It will allow types of politicians and characters to succeed in politics and in democracy in ways that we've never yeah. previously envisaged. And, and creative people will put up campaigns to either allow or to stop certain things happening in politics in ways that we that we've not yet thought of, right? In this town in Brussels, like mass online petitioning, for example, was one of the reasons that already caused TTIP to have difficulties before uh, Trump then essentially killed it off. We're going to see all of that. We're going to get more and more of that in, the, in, in the, next, the next five years. But on the other side, the efforts to essentially overload us with information to bots will become more um, uh, or clever it's already pretty difficult in the EU debate often to tell the difference between a bot and someone who's just a ranter. Um, we're going to have deep fakes of videos and photos which are going to make it even harder to tell the difference between truth and lies. Um, uh, and so we're going to have to cope, we're going to have to cope with that uh, across the board. So ultimately I think it's both ultimately is there for, yeah. is there for my answer. Um, and, and what we we, we definitely we can't turn the clock back. We can't remove the influence of these uh, of, the, of these tools on our on our politics. Um, and it's also we've got to be conscious of one final point. Maybe is, is that we there are power structures inherent in these networks. Um, the I'm lucky. I'm sat here now and have forty nine thousand followers on Twitter. Why? Not because I'm any good, but because I was early. Yeah. Right? Now, when the new technology comes along, it's as if everyone throws the cars up in the air. And then uh, they steadily come down again, and then you cement a, a, a yeah. kind of a power structure. Um, and, and that worries me as well, because if that power structure is geared up in a way where the people are holding the power are not the ones that I would like to be holding the power, that, that has some inherent problems within it too. Anyway, but yeah, I, I can't... It's, it's got to be both positive and negative. It's going to be the impact it's going to have on our democracy. Okay, well, John Worth, thank you very much for thank you. talking to us. Thank you very much.